Do you know who you are? Right. Yeah, we mentioned it, or I mentioned it just a moment ago about knowing that you know that you know that you know that you are a child of God, right? Amen. Who, who am I? Who, who, who do people say that I am? Yeah, Shepherd. Shepherd. Pastor Mike. Pastor Mike. Who do people say I am? Brother Mike? Yes. Uh, Blue, Bell. Blue Bell Mike. <laughs> Blue Bell Mike? <laughs> Spokesman for Blue Bell? <laughs> Poster boy for Blue Bell? <laughs> it depends on who you ask that question. Many of you call me Pastor Mike. Brother Mike. Some of you just call me Mike. And I'm okay with that. I'm not about titles. Y'all know that. Some people call me Michael. Some people call me Michael Dean. Some people used to say Michael Dean very forcefully. Some people would say, that's my husband. Just one person. Oh, one. Oh, that's right. We're not in that religion. Okay, that's right. Yeah, I forgot about that. One wife. I, I don't know. These people that, that have multiple, I, I'm like, Jesus in heaven. Um, some people will call me dad. Daddy. Papa. Depending on who you are, what you call me. But to see, the real question is not who you think I am, but who I think I am. But it's not more than, it's more than who I think I am, but who I confess that I am. Who I know that I am. Most people go through life without fully knowing who they are or what their purpose is. A lot of people go through life not knowing who they are and what their purpose is. But let me just tell you that God knows your purpose. God knows who you are. There's absolutely no confusion in who you are in His eyes. We're the ones that are confused, not God. Jeremiah 29, 11 very plainly says, I know the plans that I have for you. They're plans to prosper. They're plans of good, not evil. God, God's not playing this, uh, He's not playing this trickery game, and he's, he's not playing like hunger games with you where you're trying to survive. How many people have seen that movie? I love it. Oh, yeah, that's cool. I love it. But God knows the plan. But here's the thing is, is that a lot of times we have the tendency to function in our life, listen, under the limitations of what people say or think about us. A lot of the time, in fact, most of the time in our lives, we do not function to our fullest potential because of what someone has said to us or said about us or what they believe or think about us. And, and we take this and, and it, 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 it dominates in our minds. Can you imagine, I, I, was, <clears throat> I was just up here, uh, when I was up here worshiping, and, and, and the Lord just started to, to download some things into me, just to drop some things. So these, this is fresh, this is like hot off of the press as far as what He was speaking into me. As he, he reminded me about Moses. Can, can you imagine being Egyptian Hebrew? <laughs> I mean, that doesn't exist. But I'm sure that's what people were thinking. You are a Hebrew by birth, but you're over there living in the palace like an Egyptian. You dress like an Egyptian. You, isn't there a song that does that? Walk like an Egyptian? That, that's a long time ago. 
But can you imagine, though? Can you imagine having this, this constant thought that is, that is pounding your brain? I was born a Hebrew. I was born a quote-unquote slave because the, the children of God were slaves to the Egyptians. I was born into slavery. I'm a Hebrew by birth, but I'm over here living in the air-conditioned shack of the Pharaoh. Now, they didn't have air conditioning back then, but I'm sure it was, they had somebody doing like this. So it seemed like air conditioning. But think about this thought that he had in his mind. He had to. He was a person. He was a man just like me. You know, he, he, was, he, was, he was human. So he experienced emotions and he, he, I'm sure, thoughts ran through his mind, swirled in his mind. I was born as a slave. Look, my people are out there in the sand making bricks while I'm over here sipping on a martini. Can you imagine what, what's going on in his mind? What about later on in his life? After he killed the Egyptian, and then he runs to the back part of the desert and hides in the back of the desert. What, what is going through his mind now? I'm a coward. I, I run from adversity. Now, uh, maybe, maybe that's not the way y'all think. But... I'm sure that if I was in his situation, in, in his shoes, in his sandals, that I would probably be having these things running in my mind. I, I, I didn't want to face... I didn't want to face the Pharaoh. I didn't want to face the situation. I allowed anger to rise up in me, and I did something, and I ran from it. And now I'm hiding in the back of the desert. I'm a coward. Or when the burning bush moment is going on and, and he's standing before him and, and he's, telling, he's telling God, he's like, you got the wrong guy. I don't have the goods. I don't have what it takes to do what you're asking me to do. What about Joseph? Joseph came to my, to my mind. Remember... A lot of the times we have the tendency to function in life under the limitations of what people say or believe about us. What about Joseph? Joseph was a dreamer. That's what his brothers called him. He was a dreamer. He got thrown into a pit, got sold into slavery, ended up in Potiphar's house. Then Potiphar's wife started coming on to him. So then he's accused of adulterous situations by her. And it's like, it's like one thing after another. Can you imagine what's going through his mind, what he's thinking? What have I done wrong? What have, what have I done? What about the people that Paul, the Apostle Paul, was trying to minister to? The, the Apostle Paul was trying to share the love of Christ. He was trying to share the gospel with people. But everywhere he went, his past always came up. Yep. You're Saul. You're Saul of Tarsus. You're a murderer. You're a liar. They never brought up, hey, this is Paul. He's bringing us the gospel. All right. No, they were running from him because they feared his past. So every now listen I'm not saying that Paul didn't walk out victorious because we know he did. He 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 wrote the majority of the New Testament that we study and that we receive. God used him in a mighty way to do something. But so often we're reminded of failures, aren't you? You're the same way and so am I. So often we're reminded of our failures and our faults in our life. And we live by these limitations. We, we don't strive for more because we, we fear failure. We fear what will be said about us. We fear what, will, what, will, what we will be labeled as. Oh, that's a good one right there, label. Anybody ever been labeled? I wear many labels. 
I choose not to allow them to define who I am. I wear many labels. People talk trash on me all the time. I, I, could, I could tell you so many stories of what people say behind my back, and I could give two flips of a wooden nickel. That's it, baby. <laughs> what did you say? That's me? Exactly right. Because I've got the skin of an alligator, but I've also got the heart of clay that the Father is constantly molding, constantly working in His hands. I want to take us on a little road trip, if you will follow with me. i got a lot of time, brother. John chapter 1. At least I didn't start in Genesis chapter 1. <laughs> John chapter 1. Look in John chapter 1. It says, In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. I wonder who Him is. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. He is Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Look at what he says in verse 14. The Word became flesh. The Word became human and made His home among us. But this is, where the, this is where the story takes a turn. I skipped over some very important information. Purposely, I skipped over verse 10 and 11. So let's take a look. Because God came in flesh, He came to the world to, as a human and made His home among us. And in verse 10, He came into the very world that He created, but the world didn't recognize Him. He came to His own people, and even they rejected Him. I know what it is to be rejected. I know what it is to, to be labeled. I do. I know what it is to be rejected. And I know what it is to be labeled. Identity often is attached to something or someone. Thad brought this out in his message on Wednesday night. You act just like your father. And our identity is formed by that. That's just one of the many statements that he made. You act just like your father. And oftentimes we buy into that. And if our father is a failure, then we live out the identity of a failure. If our father is a, a let's just say, a drunk, or maybe is succumbed to drugs that we come to this summation that that's all we'll ever be, well, it's all we'll ever amount to, so I'm just going to go ahead and walk that path. Or something has taken place in your past. Somewhere along the line, something has happened to you, and you have not dealt with those things, and so therefore you live out something that's controlling your life that you never dealt with. You're labeled. 
I'm still in John chapter 1, and we see this label attached to Jesus. Before I go to that, if you remember, I've said this in many messages in the past. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. You know what we could put into that statement? Because tribulation is not really a word we use in 2023. You're going to get labeled as a Christian. I pointed out in Scripture last week, when we choose to be a Christ follower, you will face persecution. So don't, don't think that it's just, where did that come from? How did, why did that happen? Because I'm choosing to take a stand for Christ. That's why it's happened. It doesn't mean I'm doing something wrong. In fact, it's just the opposite. It means that I'm doing what's right. And so therefore, I'm being attacked. I'm being labeled. And we see this with, with Jesus. In, in uh, John chapter 1, we see as Jesus is calling His disciples to follow Him, Philip goes looking for Nathaniel. And when he gets to Nathaniel, he tells Nathaniel in John chapter 1 verse 45, We found Him, the very one that Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus. He's the, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Listen to that statement. He is the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And then in verse 46, what does Nathaniel say? Are you serious? You have to be mistaken. Are you sure what you're talking about? I mean, really, do you even do you even know what you're saying? I know your, your Bible doesn't say all that. My version does. You must have lost your mind. That's what he was saying when he makes this statement. Can anything good come from Nazareth? He labeled Jesus before he ever met him. He put a tag upon the Savior of the world before he ever stood face to face with him. I wonder how many people, I don't wonder, it really doesn't matter to me. Again, my wife is correct, it doesn't matter how much trash is talked upon me. How many things have been said by people that have never stood in my presence? They have no clue who I am. They have no clue what my character is. And they have no clue that as I said a couple of weeks ago that I would charge hell with a garden hose on their behalf. We're not here for a popularity contest, y'all. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Can anything good possibly happen in Port Acres, Texas? No, I'm, I'm just saying, these are labels, right? This is what Nathaniel was saying. A ministry in Port Acres? <laughs> really? Who's going to go there? People that want a real authentic relationship with Christ. That's who. Look in Luke chapter 4. Because often we, you know, we talk about in this, in this identity, we, we, we talk about these things. I thought I had it marked here. There we go. In, in, in Luke chapter 4, this is, this is when, this is Jesus, and as it says in Luke chapter 4 verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River, and He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. I'm just going to stop right there for a moment. 
Because in that story, a lot of times, we tie that with what Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation, you'll be tempted, you're going to go through some things, but be of good cheer, because I've already overcome them. And then we leave that story right there. And we say, well, if Jesus did it, then I can do it, right? If I just trust Him and I follow Him, then I can do it. I can overcome things, right? But that's really not what the enemy was doing there. We've got to understand that the enemy was, was attacking Jesus' identity. Listen, that is what he was doing. He was attacking the identity of the Savior. Anybody ever had their identity attacked? Come on. You're allowed to raise your hands in this class. <laughs> In verse 3, the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God. If, 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 if you are the Son of God. I don't think he was confused. He even asked him again in, in verse 9, If you are the Son of God. If you are. Well, if you really are a Christian, you wouldn't act that way. If you, really, if you really were, if you really are a spiritual leader, you would sure be more Christ-like. If you really were a real pastor, you would wear a suit. And a tie. Because you're really not wearing a suit if you don't wear a tie. You're wearing a sports jacket. How many people saw me or was here in the building when I wore a ball cap? Mm -hmm. I'm going to blow every one of your minds next week if you come. <laughs> that ought to spur enough intrigue that you want to be here. <laughs> Because if you're not in the building next week, it's going to be two weeks before you see it on YouTube. <laughs> I didn't realize it, but God was stirring this. Frenchie said something to me a few weeks back. And, and I, I, I mean, I always, listen, I pick on Frenchie a lot. Charles picked on Frenchie. But Frenchie is, is one of the most solid standards don't don't I, I'm, I'm I'm honoring you <laughs> but he, he's one of the most I, I say he is the most consistent that is here faithfully without fail that that I do look to I, I'm not I'm not putting you on a pedestal above Christ but I do honor you and 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 respect you and what you stand for in the kingdom of God. Amen. And you said something to me a few weeks ago that really, really dropped into my spirit and encouraged me way more than what you can possibly imagine, is that after, after, near, after 28 years of being a Christ follower and over 25 years of ministry, you said, I finally became a preacher. <laughs> And although that was funny, and still is, that's more spiritual than most people possibly can really fathom. It's because I always follow, I always followed some sort of a, a guideline, so to speak. But I have found that I have been pressing in more than I ever have and tuning my ear more than I ever have to hear what the Father is saying. And sometimes we have to get really quiet. Our lives are super busy. Y'all know that. Everybody's lives. Every person in here, every person watching this, it, our lives are busy and they are chaotic. But the more you really press in and say, God, I really need to hear from you. I need to know. And so I had no idea that, that God started giving me next week's message before He gave me this week's message. And I'm like, that ain't going to fly. But once you hear today's message, you're going to see why I'm going to preach what I preach next week unless I'm not here for some reason. 
but this this is how it works. Listen, listen. In in John chapter four, the enemy is really attacking attacking Jesus's identity here, and in verse fourteen, look at what happens. Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Can I just inject that if you're trying to function without the Holy Spirit's power, you're spinning your wheels. Amen. Your wheels are in the mud. And, and you, are not, you are not gaining any kind of traction whatsoever. In fact, there's, there's a scripture that really I can't put a pinpoint on it right now, but it says that you are as a sound of a gong. You're annoying. I don't know who that was for, but that's for somebody. Reports about him spread quickly throughout the whole region, and he taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Does y'all's Bible say that? That he was praised by everyone? How many people know who Paul Harvey is? You've heard of Paul Harvey? I used to listen to Paul Harvey every single day. How many people have heard the rest of the story? That was, that was his hallmark. That, that is what everyone knew. When they heard the rest of the story, they knew who was speaking. And they knew that when they heard his voice, that that is what was coming, the rest of the story. Well, this is the rest of the story. Because Jesus was going around after he was full of the power of the Holy Spirit. He was going around, going to synagogues, teaching, telling them about the kingdom of God. And he was praised by everyone. But then the rest of the story. He goes to his hometown. You know the people that know your past. The people that know the things you've said. What you've done. Where you've been. Where you were last night. When he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home, he went as usual... As usual, he went to the synagogue. Even Jesus went to be taught. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Even Jesus submitted himself to being taught. And he says, He went as usual to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where this was written. And this is the rest of the story. This is where things changed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released and that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor is standing right in front of you. He didn't say it like that. You're going to see that that's really what he said. He said that the time of the Lord's favor has come. And he rolled up the scroll and he handed it back to the attendant and then he sat down. And all eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. And then he began to speak to them. The scripture that you just heard has been fulfilled this very day. He was telling them, I am the one that the Scripture is talking about. This is the rest of the story. Everyone spoke well of him and was amazed by his gracious words that came from his lips, but this possibly cannot be because this is Joseph's son. 
There is no way that he is the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. That's what they were saying. That's what they were saying in that statement. Isn't this Joseph? Isn't this the little boy that was crawling around on the floor underneath the pews all the time when we were in the synagogues? Isn't this the boy that was running and playing in the streets? Isn't this the same one labeled? His identity was reduced from Savior of the world to Joseph's son. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You will always behave in the way that is consistent with your thoughts. Do you think that he thought, I'm just Joseph's son? First of all, Joseph was his adopted father. In other words, Mary was his birth mother. He was, he was immaculately conceived by the seed of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph was there as the father figure in his life. But his father... He knew who his father was. He knew who his father was. So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So if I go around all the time saying, well, I'm no good or I'm this or that, I'm going to live out that way in my life. And I'm not going to fulfill what I know that I can fulfill because who I put my trust in. And the thing is, is... If the enemy can't change what you think about God, he'll come against what you think about yourself. Yeah. Because if he can get you to, to believe that you're a failure, then you're going to live out as a failure. If he can convince you to believe that, well, your, your daddy or your mother was an alcoholic, so that's all you're going to ever be. And so you stumble a couple of times in your life and you just resort to, well, I guess that's for me. I guess that's all I've got looking forward to. Or whatever it is, when we begin to let this drop into our spirit and we begin to live it out every day, then we resort to saying, well, this is all I'm going to ever be. I'll, I'll never be any better than that. So as a man thinks in his heart, let me just say, as a person, as a woman, as a boy, as a girl, as a mom or a dad, as we think in our hearts, so we will be. So if the enemy, if the enemy can't come against you and get you to change um, the way you think about the Father, then he's going to come after what you, th you think about yourself. And he'll attack the, what you think about yourself. But see, here's the thing is, is that God says something totally different about who you are. Do you know who you are in Christ? You know, we can sit in a setting like this. We can sit in a, in a church like this and we can say, yeah, I know who I am. Oh, yeah, I know. But let me tell you something. The Word of God proclaims something in your life. When you submit yourself to Christ, He says in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, He says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. You see, this is a, this is a word from Him. This is a word from Him to you to make you known who you are. You see, there's no question. If you, if you, ask, if you ask my, uh, my oldest daughter, Amber, if you ask her who I am, she's going to say, Daddy. That's my daddy. Why, why does she call me Daddy? Because she knows who she is. And she knows who I am. There's no question about it. I'm not Mike to her. I'm not Michael to her. I'm Daddy. And listen, I'm 50 years old. And I don't call my dad Mark. I call him Dad. So when I call him on the phone, which I know is hardly never... I do the same thing to my mom. I'm, 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 
I'm no respecter of persons. I equally don't call my mom as much as I don't call my dad. But I don't say, hey, Mark, what's up? I say, hey, Dad, how are you doing? Because I know who I am, and I know who He is. The Lord is telling us, and He's reminding us here, that if we are led by the Spirit of God, then we are children of God. So, you have not received the Spirit that makes you fearful slaves, but instead you've received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children, and now we can call Him Abba Father. We can call Him Daddy. We don't have to call out by some official name or some official title. We can say Daddy. Daddy, I'm going through this. Daddy, I need you. Daddy, Daddy, are you listening to me? He says, for His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Do you know? Do, do you know who you are? Do, do you know who you are? Do you know who your daddy is? Thad pointed out in his teaching on Wednesday night, one of the things that he pointed out is one of the things that we go through in our society today is that so many children are coming up that have no clue who their daddy is because the father is absent in the home. You know, there's, in other, there's a lot of broken homes. So there's a lot of single moms. There's a lot of moms that are playing the role of father and mother. And that goes both ways. There's also fathers that are single fathers that are playing both father and mother and raising the children. So I understand it's not one gender sided. I get that. But you know what? There are a lot of homes that have a physical dad in the home, but they are totally absent from the family. They are not fulfilling the role that God intended them to fulfill in the home. And so as a result, we have generations. It's not something that just happened in the last 20 years. This is something that has been happening over the last couple, if not more than that generation, slowly progressing towards that lack of leadership inside the home. You see, God intended for the man to lead the home, lead the family, lead the children, teach them the Word of God, showing them how to live for Christ. It was never supposed to be the woman to take on the role of the man. And that's some things that Thad had pointed out. We've got generations that are growing up and this is going to really hack some people off. But that's okay because I know who I am in Christ. And I know what I am here to do. But there are men that think that they're women. And there are women that think that there are men. And there are children growing up that have no clue because they've never been taught right from wrong. This started in Genesis chapter 3. At the fall of man, y'all. This started in Genesis. This is not something that just started in the 2000s. This is not some kind of a gender equality message. I'm telling you that Satan attacked the identity of Eve in the garden. So often, so often we look at that in Genesis chapter 3 and we say, oh, well, she, you know, uh, she was tempted. And so therefore, and even some translations say she was beguiled or in other words, she was tricked. The thing is, is that her identity was challenged by the enemy. That's the core of what took place. And you say, well, how can that possibly be? And since you said that, I'm going to answer it. <laughs> But in, but in Genesis chapter 3, listen, or in Genesis chapter 2, God created man. These are some things that Thad pointed out on Wednesday night. Boy, I know you're, you're wishing you'd have been here. It, it was good. But in Genesis chapter 2, God created man. And then he, and then he, took, he looked at man and he said, Ah, that's not good that you're going to be all alone. 
I'm going through a lot of stuff right here. But he said, you're, it's not good that you're going to be alone. So he took a rib out of man, and he made a woman. Why? Why did he take a rib from man? Why didn't he just take some dirt? Thad mentioned, talked about dirt on Wednesday night. Well, why didn't he just take some more dirt and create the woman? You see, because he took a piece out of man so that there would be a need for fulfillment. The man needs a woman, not another man. The man needs a woman, and the woman needs the man, so that you fulfill one another. That is the necessity. That God, that's the way God designed us. And so, in, in, in the other scriptures, the, the, the word tells us, he says, women, and listen, this is not to degrade anyone. This is not a degrading message. Please listen. God said, I, I want the woman to submit to the man as the leader of the home. It's not that I'm better than her. It's not that I'm, yeah, I know I am stronger. I get that. But there has to be a leader. There has to be someone that is held accountable. Amen. And that is me. I'm the one that's held accountable in my home and in my family because I am the spiritual leader. I'm not just the shepherd or the under shepherd of this ministry. I am the covering for my family. I'm the covering for my wife. I'm the covering of my children Absolutely. as they grow. And then they step out and they go into their own coverings and they go into their own homes. But I am her covering. And so what the enemy was doing when he came against Eve in the garden, he was saying, you're below him. Now, you don't find these words, but this is the, what he was attacking her identity. Don't you want to be as strong as the man? Don't you want to have the same amount of power? God's holding back on you. He thinks you're weaker. You're not good enough to be the leader. Adam's always going around, bossing you around, telling you what to cook why you're not cleaning the house, why he's got to come home after hunting buffalo. <laughs> and all he wants to do is talk about that smell that's going on in the garbage can. Why can't you take that garbage out before I get home? I got to be out there slaying animals and I'm in blood and guts. And then I got to come home and I got to take the trash out. What do you do all day? You just sit around and Facebook all day long? <laughs> I mean, if they had Facebook back then. <laughs> Is that all you do? And, and so we see the enemy attacking her identity saying, don't you want to be like Adam? But what did he say? Don't you want to be like God? Because if you remember, Adam was created in the image of God after the likeness of God. Don't you want to be equal? This is what the enemy does. This is the tactic of the enemy. He, come against his, he comes against your identity, and it started with Eve attacking her identity. Attacking what God created. So what does God say about you? He says if you're led by the Spirit of God, you're the children of God. He says you didn't receive the spirit of a fearful slave, but you're an heir of God and an equal heir with Jesus. So many people go through life and they're like, well, I'm just going to be a little meek and meek and marry me. That ain't what the Word says. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. That ain't what the Word says. I say rise up, child of God. I say rise up and take your position in the kingdom of God. I don't care what gender you are. Amen. Rise up in the kingdom of God and let's go. Jesus dealt with this. And I'm, I'm going to close with these verses of Scripture. Who do men say that I am? This, this is what Jesus said. It says in it says in Matthew chapter 16, in verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? 
who, who do people say? This, this is Jesus having a conversation with his disciples. Who, who are people? Who do people think I am? Who, who do people say that I am? And in, in this conversation with his disciples, they replied, well, I mean, you know, some some people say John the Baptist. Some people say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah or maybe even one of the other prophets. And then Jesus turns the question on them. Instead of saying, what does everybody else say? He says, what do you say? Who, who do you who do you say that I am? And see, this is the question for you today. Who do you and me, who do you say that he is? Is he just a teacher? Is he, just, is he someone that is, his face is on a wall somewhere in a frame at your grandmother's house with flowing brown hair and blue eyes Caucasian Jesus what's that Fabio Jesus with the wind lightly blowing in his hair nothing like that at all not, not what you think he is and Again, I, I referenced Thad's message on Wednesday night is that Jesus is really a lot different than what most people think. Because instead of charging hell with a garden hose like I mentioned earlier, he charged hell with guns blazing violently. You know what? Sometimes hell is not a place. Sometimes hell is right here in the midst of you and me. And when Jesus comes in, he starts flipping tables. He don't come in sometimes holding a little baby lamb, petting its head, saying, oh, you precious thing. Sometimes he comes in with the sword swinging. Because sometimes that's what we need. So Jesus turns the question on them and says, Who do you say that I am? And Peter, Peter, Simon Peter answered quickly and says, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied to him, You are blessed, Simon, son of John. King James calls him son of Barjona son of Barjona. You see, in their day, they were always equated by their family lineage. It was not John Wilson. It was John, son of William. Or you follow. All right. So if I was walking in this time, I would be known as Michael, son of Mark. That would be my name. He's saying to John, he said, I mean to Simon, he says, Simon, son of John, you are blessed because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now, this is the rest of the story. You ready for the rest of the story? Because when you learn who he is, he gives you your true identity. Simon, his identity is about to change just like that. I mean, as quick as I just snapped my fingers, his identity is changed from Simon, son of John, son of Barjona, Peter, the rock. He changes his identity from who he used to be. In other words, he changes who he was. In other words, he's no longer going to be identified. You're just like your father. He's no longer going to be identified by, you're always a failure. 
He's no longer going to be identified as Saul of Tarsus. I'm, I'm using other examples. He's no longer going to be going to be identified as a tyrant against the kingdom of God. But you're being changed in an instant when you're given your identity. But listen, it's up to you to walk out that identity just because he speaks that identity into you. You've got to walk it out every single day. You got to get up every day and you got to make that choice. I'm not going to be that old person anymore. Listen, that old person exists in my thoughts. Listen, who I used to be, those colorful four-letter words that I used to speak, those, those words of anger and tyrancy. When I was young, fresh out of Marine Corps boot camp, ready to conquer the world, you know what I'm talking about. Coming out of a place where you were taught to hate the enemy and at all cost find the enemy and kill the enemy. And then that attitude carries into life. I'm no longer wearing the uniform anymore. I still wear the title, but I don't wear the uniform. I'm doing something totally different now. But if I don't choose to be different, I will always be the same as I was before. Jesus gave Peter his real identity, and he also gave Peter his commission. Now, I'm not telling you that God's going to commission you today. He might. He may already have. I don't know. I'm just saying, you know, so many times we hear a preacher say that God will do this, and then when we go home the same that day, we don't feel different. We're like, well, that wasn't for me. No, that is a lie of the enemy. Listen, you got to accept what's being said today, and you got to go home, and you got to live this thing out every day. That's on you. I can't do it for you. You have to do it on your own. But look what he says to Peter. He says, now I say to you, you are Peter. You're no longer Simon, son of John. You are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And all of the powers of hell will not conquer you. Churches have been formed off of that right there. Denominations have been formed off of that. Off of one man. Off of one person. Let me tell you something. I'm just going to throw a scripture out there and you chew on it. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. What does a cornerstone do? A cornerstone locks in all the other stones. There's not one stone. There are many stones. We are all stones in the foundation. We are all stones in the building, but He is the chief cornerstone that holds us all together. Chew on that one for a while. Well, I could spend some time teaching on you being a rock. Now, let me tell you something. He is the rock. He is the chief cornerstone. But the chief cornerstone can't do anything if there's not other stones. There's no building. There's no foundation. The chief cornerstone brings us all together and holds us locked in. How about you? Where are you? What is your identity? Do you know your identity? I pray that you, if you don't know your identity, that you seek the one that will reveal your identity to you today. You may have come into this building today. You may, you may have heard this message. You might be listening to this message on YouTube or on Facebook. And you might be saying, man, I, I wish I knew who I am. I wish I really knew what my purpose is. And you know what? We, we, we search books and we listen to podcasts. And those things are great. They encourage us. They fulfill us. There's even a person that wrote a book about our purpose and our purpose in life. And, and that's all encouraging. But our true purpose comes from the Lord. Our true purpose comes from our identity in Christ.